Welcome to another edition of MindFit Podcast. My name is Robert Aceves, and I'm here with Neil Babbins. How are you doing, Neil? Doing very well. How are you? I'm doing great. How was your week? So far, so good. Been really busy. You know, a lot of people are reaching out because of the COVID crisis and uh, been working from home, but um, been good. It's been good so far. Doing things around yeah. the house. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's been getting pretty interesting lately, and especially with that new extension for three months in LA County, huh? Oh, my goodness. And now they're telling us, I th- did I hear it right, the ordinance that we have to put a mask on every time we leave the house? Is that? Yeah. Yeah. Now it's a new thing. Oh, and okay. there's a lot of businesses like Costco who made it into a policy now that you have to wear a mask if you want to go into their store. So mm-hmm. it's things are changing. That's for sure. <laughs> yeah. In, into the store is one thing, but even like outside to go for a run, how do you put a mask on if it's like 90 degrees? I don't, I'm kind of curious about that, how that works. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, Yeah, because they're saying that, you know, if you're running and somebody, you know, walks right next to you and they have something, their germs could, you know, be behind them for about two meters or something like that, which is about uh, 12 feet or something. So, yeah, you definitely want to be, you know, stay away from people. Yeah. So. Yeah, just a, yeah. an adjustment, you know? Yeah, just a, yeah I know. I know. A, yeah, well, you sweat more. I guess that's what you want to do when you're exercising. So, you know, yeah. that'll work. Yeah. And you know what? I've, I've been trying different masks, and I have a, a mask that I got that from one of my clients who made it for me. And it's uh, there's some that, that feel like they're, you know, hugging your face, and there's some that give you some, some breathing air inside, and, and they're not as hot. So maybe you can get one of those for going outside. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah, the ones that I have are kind of light cotton, so they're, they're well, they have like a light material to them, so actually not too bad. In fact, I was wearing it in the grocery store, and I came back into my car, and I didn't even realize I still had it on. I was driving home, because you know, I take it off in the car. And that's how light it was. It was like I didn't even realize it was on. I'm halfway home. I'm like, wow, this thing's still on me, you know. So oh, wow. yeah, it was actually kind of comfy. That's so nice. I was like, yeah. So maybe I could run in that and not worry about it. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Anyway, yeah. today uh, we're going to be talking about the five selves for success. Um, I watched this video on 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 the internet. One of those viral things. That I don't even know who it was. It didn't have their name or anything. But I, I really like what the guy said. And he talked about the five cells for success in life, and I wrote them down. This video was in Spanish, so I translated it, and today we're going to be talking about those. And so the first one is, Neil? Self-knowledge. Um, you want me to list them all? or I have No, self- just, just, just go one by one. See how, okay. how it goes. Okay. Self-knowledge is number one. Um, knowledge of self. Um, what did he say about that? What did he say about self-knowledge in, in, what, you, in what you saw? So the the first one, self knowledge, was was basically when something that I agree with is that you cannot really go anywhere in life unless you know who you are, you know. And so he was talking about knowing yourself, knowing you know your your strengths and your weaknesses. And and when I was at UCI, you know, that was one of the things that they taught us that was very important to me is if you know what strengths you have and you work on those strengths and you make them more um and you work on improving those strengths then the likelihood of you improving it is going to be a lot higher than what most people do is they they try to focus on their weaknesses oh you know i'm really bad at this i need to improve on that i need to work on that and versus just focusing on the strengths that you have so and the only way to do that is knowing yourself you know so self knowledge is important when it comes to you know understanding your mind understanding your your likes and your the things that you don't like the things that motivate you the things that that make you who you are and so mm-hmm. One of the ways to do that is to, you know, like we talked about meditation before, is to sit and literally just go inside your mind and, and start looking at yourself and see, okay, what what am I good at? You know, we all have something that we're good at. If you think we last, I think last podcast you talked about cooking, you know, if yeah. you're good at cooking, then that's something you can work on and maybe, you know, do something like that. Uh, one of the shows that I've been watching that I love is uh, Project Runway, and I, I've been watching it for years. And the last season, there was a, a lady who was 65 years old and she was an accountant or some you know office business uh, thing for, for many, many years. And then she decided to quit her job and go into designer school. And so she started designing clothes and being in, into fashion. And eventually she, you know, became this, you know, amazing designer at mm-hmm. 65 years old. So, you know, that's something that that really can happen to anybody, you know, as long as you know yourself. So I don't know what you think. 
Well, yeah, I think self-knowledge is also a journey, you know, for a lot of people to process because a lot of people think they know themselves, think they know what they like, think they know what they want to do. And, you know, this whole time with the lockdown has been actually really the silver lining has been really good for people because they get to reevaluate who, who they are and what they like to do and what, what their strong points are, the strengths, what their strengths are and what they thought their strengths were in the old world, so to speak, you know, prior to the lockdown and, and they reevaluate that and they say, you know what, I never actually enjoyed that as much as I thought I did or uh, I've always wanted to try something else. So self-knowledge is knowing why you do something at the same time as what you do and how you do it. Um, if you did it because your whole family did it or you inherited a family business or you inherited a, a value from your family, this is what you should do, um, and you ended up doing it and doing it pretty well. If all of your brothers played basketball and so did you because they did, and you realize 10 years later, you know what, I like the game, but I prefer soccer. You know, it's just self-knowledge could be a way of, of pulling apart pieces of yourself and asking yourself, is this really what I'm committed to? Is this really what lights me up? Is this really what um, I, I enjoy? Or has it been more draining for me emotionally over the years than it has been inspiring? Does it motivate you? Does it really inspire you? Or do you do it for another reason? Do you do it because of something else? Is it, you know, do you do A in order to get B or do A in order to succeed at B? Or do you do A because you you would do it anyway, even if there was nothing else, you want a deserted island and that there, you do it anyway. You know what I'm saying? Or, or rather the opposite, if you had the choice of 250,000 things, you choose to do that anyway. It's just something you automatically are drawn to. Um, and um, also self-knowledge is also knowing to me if something is an escape that you do, like there's nothing wrong with it. But if you're playing, say, video games for six hours a day or if you're um, you know playing sports or, or something like that. Is it something you actually, that actually you enjoy that lights you up or is it something that helps you take you away from something else? So is it a distraction or is it actually something that you're, you're lit up by? That'll help because over time you can, you can get burned out on things that are just distractions from other things that are going on in your life, in your world, as opposed to something you, you would do whether or not you needed to be distracted from it anyway. So that kind of self-knowledge is also important. Knowing your, your values, what's important to you and why you do what you do, you know, as opposed to what you like to do. So I think that that's, that, that to me is also at the, at the core of, of self-knowledge. You know, a lot of things that I used to do growing up that I thought I should do, you know, um, I thought I should be in the hardcore sciences when I was a kid because everybody in my community went to medical school. That's what you did. You had two choices, medical school or law school or your father's business, you know, and, um, and that was pretty much it. So I was taking all the hardcore sciences, the hardcore physics, calculus, chemistry. It took me about five years to realize that I didn't like it <laughs> and <laughs> that I wasn't too good at it. I mean, right. I, I, I had to work. Oh, my goodness. I was in my room. My mother used to say, I think my son's in the wrong program because I, <laughs> I, I, I was in there for 12 hours a day in my room, locked up, studying, you know, getting tutors and calling friends and and I was just burned out and I would, you know, I would do okay, but I wouldn't do well enough by what, what, what I consider to be my own standards. So it took me years to realize that I was doing this for other reasons. I was, you know, pursuing this for other reasons. And of course, this is major like career, but that could, that's, that's the basis of self-knowledge. I realized, you know, I'm more artistic and more creative or more abstract of a thinker. So I, I gravitated more towards psychology, obviously. And, um, but also was in the arts for a while, just like you, I was acting for a long time. I did a lot of stage work and stuff like that. So, um, it just, but it was an epiphany for me, you know, so little mm -hmm. epiphanies can tell you a lot about yourself, you know, um, why are you doing what you're doing? You know what I'm saying? What is the reason you're doing what you're doing? Do you really enjoy it? Not all aspects of it, because sometimes we're not going to like everything that we do uh, within a certain um, area or, or topic. But, you know, ask yourself why, you know, um, how come? How come I ended up doing this? Is this is this really me or is this the me that's expected of me? So I, I came home one day and told my mother I took an acting class and I'm, I'm hooked. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, likely yeah. she took it. Luckily, she took it well, you know. But you know, yeah, <laughs> I, th I think she was happier when I went back to school actually to get my graduate degree. But you know, nonetheless, you know, she was she was still happy that I was happy at the time. So that was yeah. good. I yeah. think self knowledge is what 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 does that. It makes us happy when you realize who you really are and what things you love in life and. And you work on those things that gives you this extra strength, like I mentioned earlier, and it gives you 
the ability to work more on those things that you're good at. And, you know, I, I, there was a study that I remember learning about where, you know, if you're doing typing, for example, and you're really good at uh, typing and, you know, uh, writing stuff, uh, if you worked on that strength and, and try to be better at it, you could improve like 300 times, you know, because you were already good at it. But if you were bad at typing and then you started trying to be better at it, then you would improve like 10% or 15%. So it wasn't much of a difference because you were, you were already not there. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that's for everybody. And I'm sure there are some people that, you know, were really bad at something and then they tried and, and started to improve and eventually became really good at it. Uh, I'm talking more about, you know, how can you be more of what you already are and how to improve yourself in the things that you already are instead of trying to change yourself and be something you're not. It is possible. I mean, I'm not saying it's not. And part of, like you mentioned, acting, we learn a lot about that is how to become something you're not. Mm -hmm. But even then, I tell you real quick, um, one of my teachers that I, uh, when I was doing improv, he um, he made us go around the room and everybody was you know telling everybody what they thought of them when they saw them. And so we all had this, you know, aura or thing that we portrayed. Right. We you know, this is like what you look like. And sometimes what we look like is different from what um, we think of ourselves and we would perceive ourselves to be. And and so to me, that was that was something that was very insightful, because, it, you know, if you're in, 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 in the world of acting, if you're trying to be. You know, if I'm trying to be white and I'm really Mexican, then I may not be very successful at that. But if, you know, if I look Mexican and I try to go for Mexican roles, then maybe I'm, I'm going to be more successful be just because of that. Now, that's a little superficial, but it's still at the same time, you know, we're talking about what makes people successful in life. And mm -hmm. that's one way to to look at it, too. And so um, let's talk about the next one. Self-esteem. Okay. What do uh -huh. you think about that? Self-esteem. Wow, that's a big one. Uh, a lot of people, um, I work with a lot of clients, of course, and they always tell me that my self-esteem has been suffering lately. And I always ask them, what do you mean by that? Tell me what you mean by self-esteem. I get a lot of different definitions. <laughs> so um, self-esteem, you know, I, I think self-esteem relates to what we we're talking about earlier about self-knowledge, knowing why you do something or how come you do something. Is something truly light you up? Is something truly make you feel uh, like you have a sense of purpose? Um, you know, the question, who are you? Like you just said about acting. You know, one thing about acting is when we're, we're trying to be somebody else on stage. But actually, another way of looking at it is we're trying to use a part of ourself on stage that we is maybe smaller and less of, of who we are actually. But we want to take that small part of us and expand it, amplify it. So it becomes the lead part of who we are. So that's who we're portraying on stage. So a lot of the characters that we play um, are actually already inside of us in some way, and we just have to sort of weave it together. So esteem could be a sense of what part of you shines the most? What part of you um, makes you feel like you have the strongest sense of purpose? What part of you um, makes you feel like you want to get up in the morning? You know, that you want to accomplish something? That gives you, that gives you the best feedback, positive feedback from people. You know, I think the best compliment, and I'm not, I, I want to say this with delicacy because I don't want people to think I have a uh, major ego or anything, but when a client says, to, when a client says to me, there's a silence and a client looks up at me and says, you're good. You know, that's like the best feeling for me, not because I'm good, but because they got something, you know, about the questions that we've been, I've been asking them or the work we've been doing. And when, I, when they say I'm good, what they really mean is they got something about themselves. So they got a part of themselves that, um, you know, is, is that they've connected to. So um, self-esteem, what do you do well? What gives you a sense of purpose? Uh, what is a ser of service to others that you get a lot of positive feedback from? Um, what is something that after you've accomplished it, you walk away feeling, yeah, that's 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 what I, that's me. That's my identity. That's that's the that's the way I feel the most powerful, the most motivated. Um, and also, I think it's important with esteem, if I can say this, knowing what you aren't so um, effective at, or or knowing what is not your strength. Um, in mine, it's 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 sort of like technology. You know, like when it comes to developing podcasts or. Um, you know, I'm not that great at the technical side of it. You know, it's just not my thing. I could learn and I could do it. And part of my esteem also is overcoming that heap that tells me I can't do it. 
that voice in my head that says you're not good at this, you know, the part of me that can actually get it done and get it done fairly well, that's also increases esteem. Um, mm-hmm. But also knowing that it's okay. It's okay that you're not strong at everything. It's okay if you weren't the best athlete, even if you tried. It's okay if you're not um, mechanical and other people are. You know, it's okay that I need to call a plumber. I can't fix it myself. Uh, speaking of which, this morning, you know, someone came to my house. <laughs> someone came to my house. I'm like, no, you can't be here. I've got to get on a podcast. Um, but I can't fix it myself. I mean, some people can. I know some people who can literally take it apart and put it back together. And like, wow, I, I wish I had that. Now, if again, with esteem, if I tried to do it, if I watched it on YouTube, if I really focused on it, if I made the time to do it, I could probably do a lot better than I think I could. So that's also esteem. It's okay if you're not as good at something, but it's also okay if you do the best you can at something, you'd be surprised at what you could accomplish. That's also a sense of esteem. So it's sort of a spectrum, you know, knowing what you're good at, knowing what you're not good at, but not stopping simply because I'm not good at that, so I'm not going to do that. You know, that's 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 my exploration of esteem. I would say, <laughs> yeah. You know, my one of my stories that I love um, uh, is years ago I, I met this guy who uh, whose dad owned a. Um, uh, it was like a magazine in Newport or something like that, but um, I don't even remember what the name of it was. But I remember he, um, I went to his office and he was showing me all the stuff and how they did it, and because he worked with his dad and they were very successful. And one of the things that I loved was that there were, I think there were about ten salespeople in the office. They all had access to the same magazine, right? They were all selling the ads for the magazine. And and he was telling me, you know, that the the most successful salesperson in the office was selling like two hundred fifty thousand um, uh, dollars. I mean, that was how much he was making. So he was selling probably millions of dollars in ads. Mm-hmm. And then the person who was making the least amount of money in the office was making about thirty five thousand dollars or something like that. And I'm like, wow, that's a huge difference. You know, ten different people. The most successful one was making two hundred fifty thousand, and the the least successful was making thirty five thousand in the same office with the same tools, same magazine, and so I was wondering, like, so what what happened? Like, why is this guy making two hundred fifty thousand, and this one was making thirty five thousand? And he was saying that uh, he was telling me that the person who does the fifty two hundred fifty thousand, he would only talk to people that were you know high clients, high end clients, and he would focus on people that that made more money and that you know could bring him the 250,000 and I was like and what does the person that makes 35,000 do he's like oh well he's constantly talking to people that are complaining and you know who are unhappy and and just you know not making that much money and so he he's wasting a lot of his time on people like that so therefore he doesn't make you know the 250,000 so to me that was kind of an example of self-esteem because you know again they all had the same access to everything they nobody was stopping the guy who's making 35,000 from going after the big you know accounts and mm-hmm. the rich people they're mm-hmm. both in Newport you know they both had the same um you know freedom and yet the self-esteem part of it, of things sometimes is the thing that stops us from doing the things that we want to do and yeah. and and to me self-esteem is like how much we value ourselves and i always i think i mentioned this in one of the other podcasts then in spanish uh, the word for self-esteem is autoestima and mm-hmm. it's like self-esteem like like the how much we estimate you know it's a self-estimate how much do we estimate ourselves mm. to be worth what what's the value that we put in our our time and our are things that we do and so this is really important because if you don't value yourself then nobody else is going to value yourself as much as you could you know and if you devalue yourself then you're probably not going to appreciate what people do for you sometimes and so self-esteem is important for everything and uh, again everybody has the same access to everything we we all have you know and I'm talking in the sense that we can cho- make choices and, and, and yes, maybe some people live in different countries that are not as you know advanced as we are here in the U.S. and they don't have access to some other things. But as far as like how much we value ourselves, it doesn't really matter if you don't have money or have money. I think it's more of a thing that you have, like you said, in, inside like your core values and, and, and you can still live, you know, a, a good life even though you may not have a lot of money and, and be, you know, worth something, you know. 
Oh, absolutely. And I, I, as, and I think that, you know, esteem and uh, self-esteem and self-knowledge are connected because a lot of times, like you said, someone who's earning 35000 as opposed to somebody who's earning 250000 again, you want to examine what your values are. Did you, are you earning two fifty because your, your, your family sort of gave you the values that you should earn that? Or are you earning 35000 because somebody along the line, looking back at your um, your history in terms of esteem, told you that you weren't good enough or you weren't adequate enough? Is that a belief, a core belief that you're holding about yourself? So self-knowledge is important towards self-esteem also. When people tell me they have no self-esteem, it's because their beliefs about themselves have somehow become distorted by uh, growing up. They were given a message, they internalized a message from somewhere that something about them was inadequate or less than. So they gravitate toward the people like you like you were talking about who talk about their problems more, more problem focused and hence don't pay them as much, don't compensate them as much, don't value them as much. So their own self-worth, the, the salesperson, will go down because they've internalized a message along the way that there's something less than about them. So self-knowledge is knowing, wait a second, how do I know this about myself? How do I know that that's true? How do I know that I'm less than? How do I know that I, I'm not as good as somebody else? So what are, what are you good at and what are you not? The question you also want to ask yourself is how do I know that? How do I know I'm not good at closing the deal? How do I know I'm not good at running a big business? How do I know I'm not good at attracting rich customers if that's what I want to attract? You know, right. um, So that's a very important question. What are your core beliefs about yourself and where do they come from? Where did they come from? How did they get there? Because I always tell people, you were not born with them. You weren't born with core beliefs. You were born with the template to create them, to generate them, but you weren't born with them. So where did they come from? And that will also give you access to your own esteem and your, and your mm -hmm. own self-knowledge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Um, next one is self-regulation. Self-regulation is also important because, you know, it's, an, it's, a, it's a way of controlling our own behavior, our emotions and our thoughts in the pursuit of long-term goals. So things that we want, you know, if we can regulate, self-regulate ourselves and say, okay, I need to do this and I'm going to do whatever it takes. You know, if, if my goal is to run a marathon, I am going to have to, you know, wake up every morning and run five miles every day for five days and then I'm going to do one long run uh, per week and, and, and you do it, you know, and true, there may be some days where, you know, you feel like, oh my gosh, you know, I don't want to get up in the morning, it's too cold or it's raining or, you know, oh, I didn't sleep well last night, but whatever the, the reason may be, you want to get back on your feet and, you know, regulate your behavior and say, okay, I, I promised myself I was going to do this and then you do it again and then do it and again and again and again until you run the marathon, which, you know, could take months to train, but the feeling that comes from after running that marathon is just unbelievable, you know, and that's just an example, but it could be anything you want in your life. You know, you if you regulate yourself and and say, OK, I need to do this and control your emotions and control everything you you need to do in order to accomplish that, then the chances of you getting it are going to be much higher. So, yeah, yeah. Reg Self-regulation also is, um, you know, mindfulness, which is a really big movement right now and being in the here yes. and now, you know, meditation. Um, and um, regulation is when we, there's a difference between, I tell this a lot to people, our visceral response, our emotional response, and our reaction. So we have a, uh, an emotional rea a response to a lot of triggers around us, a lot of things that activate us around us. And then we have a, a reaction, which is our action and behavior that follows. So there's a difference between how we feel in a moment and what we do. So there's a, there's a, a brief period of time, sometimes only a few milliseconds in between when we have an emotional response to something, a visceral response in our body to a reaction to what we do. There's sometimes a very small period of time. And in that time, that's when we can regulate. That's when we can ask ourselves, okay, someone just said something to me that irritated, that I got frustrated. There was a vis visceral response of frustration. What am I going to do with that frustration? Am I going to be with the frustration, which only lasts, by the way, for about 90 seconds, if you just let a feeling be? Um, am I going to be with the frustration and self-soothe, or am I going to say something? Now, it, there's no right answer, but the reaction, whether you're going to say something or do something, has to do with allowing yourself to be with the feeling gives you the freedom to choose. Do I want to be with this frustration or whatever it may be? Or do I want to say something or advocate for my feelings? But now you have a choice. If you could sit with the feeling, then you could choose. If you can't sit with the feeling, you're going to definitely react. You're definitely going to try to um, 
ha- manage the feeling by telling somebody off or by leaving the room or by shutting somebody out or by uh, overreacting or by doing whatever you do. And that's, you know, that could topple your success. I mean, if you're the boss, okay. You could yell at people in the room and no one's going to fire you. But most people have to climb a ladder of some sort. Most people have somebody to answer to in some capacity. So emotional regulation becomes important to know when is it time, even as a, as a leader, even if you're the boss, even if you are your own sole proprietor, knowing when to say something, knowing how to say it, you know, regulating yourself so that you don't just jump into the modus operandi that you typically have when you have a visceral response. That's that's the, I know that later on we'll talk about leadership as the, as the fifth one, but that's also part of strong leadership, self-leadership, is knowing how to regulate yourself, knowing how to, knowing how to speak to people even when they are upsetting you, even when you are upset about a situation. You know, th- this morning, this morning, my uh, plumber came by my house, was supposed to come after 10, after <laughs> we'd done our taping. He came uh, 15 minutes before we started. Now, I was, yes, I was annoyed. I was frustrated. Did I say something? No. I decided to self-soothe. It'll be gone in 90 seconds. Just go about doing what you're doing. Uh, maximize the potential to have him leave before I need, by the time I need him to leave. And that's exactly what I did. So, but sometimes I might say, if he's going to like linger, I might have said, you know, I appreciate the fact that you're here, but I had requested somebody come at this time rather than this time. And I really have something I have to do and I can't have somebody else in the space. You know what I mean? But I, I was able to choose how to regulate my feelings. I didn't just get upset and like, heaven forbid, slam the door on his face or something like that or call up my, you know, uh, <laughs> yeah. office and say, how come you sent somebody at the wrong time? I mean, I could do that. But right. that's that to me that that was not the way that I wanted to regulate, not the way I wanted to to run my day. So mm-hmm. you know, yeah. So that's, that's what awesome. I think about. Yeah, yeah. And I, I that's that's really uh, what this is about. It's having that choice to okay, I'm gonna take 90 seconds to to breathe and and to take this you know reframe myself in the situation and try to take the advantage of it as much as I can so and that has to do with the next one by the way which is yeah, self motivation mm-hmm. it's also important to to keep yourself you know motivated and to you know keep yourself creative and be able to develop things in your mind and you know uh, produce things that that make you happy and we know we know ourselves you know again if you if you have the self knowledge and the self esteem and you self regulate then you can also know what motivates you and and use more of that so you can you know, move along the things that that make you happy and that that make you want to, you know, get out of bed in the morning and the the things that make you want to run that marathon and you know have some goals for you know short term and long term. Think about you know uh, the things that that move you from from the inside and 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 do that you know because you really uh, there's no one more important than you. And, and, and if you know yourself and you know what motivates you, then you really have the key to do anything, you know, and that's what mm-hmm. I think. I don't know what your take is on that. On self-motivation. Um, you know, a lot of people say that they can't get motivated. They say this, this is a common problem, but there's a great quote by Marianne Williamson that I love that sort of speaks into it. And she says, our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. So when you feel that you're not motivated to do something because you don't know if you could do it or you're not good enough or it's too much work, the truth is there's a lot of ingrained, innate fear in us that we actually, not only can we do it, but we might be successful beyond measure and that we might actually have to rise to the occasion and become responsible for the fact that we are very powerful leaders and very powerful people. So self-motivation sometimes is looking at what's stopping you, what's blocking you, as opposed to what motivates you, as well as like what you were saying to, to, to piggyback on that. It's also what's blocking you, what's blocking you from doing it. What is the fear? The fear is, I'll fe- is that I'll fail, a lot of people say, or that I, it won't do any good. Possibly, but is there also a fear that you might actually do it really well and that it's serving you in some way to not do the best job you can because that way you get to stay safe. You get to stay the way you, mm-hmm. you, still, you still are. Right. But what happens Mm -hmm. if you do really, really, really well? Whoa. You know, what happens if it really (laughs) takes off? You know, all of a sudden all eyes are on you, you know, and and there's it's a whole different ballgame then. So actually, that is one of our biggest fears. All eyes Mm -hmm. on us, you know, so motivate your motivation is also 
what, like you say, what's in, what's inside that's lighting you up, but also what's stopping you? What's stopping you from actually sitting down and doing it or getting up and doing it, whatever it may be. So I yeah. think that's, yeah, that's what I think. Yeah. I, you know, and I, real quick, when I, when I was training for the marathon, one thing that I'd love is reading. So I, I would bring my book, uh, my uh, iPad and, you know, there was a book in, in it, like a digital version of it. And I would just put it on the treadmill and, and start reading. And it motivated me so much to go for a run, you know, that I, I just wanted to go, you know, for a run all the time. And then the long days when I was running, uh, you know, 10, 15, 20 miles, I was reading, you know, almost a whole book and, and it was just amazing, you know. Mm. So that's just one way you can self-motivate yourself and figure out things that you like. I know people that, you know, love food and and would love to eat like a bazooki from BJ's Pizza. And yeah. so they 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 would, you know, run a marathon just so they can eat that mar- that bazooki without, you know, feeling bad about it. So mm. um, just think about what motivates you. What What is it that makes you happy and that makes you want to do things in your life? So... Um, and then the last one, by the way, is self leadership. You already mentioned that earlier, and mm-hmm. you know, I, I feel like once you have all the other ones that we mentioned, self leadership is basically just knowing, you know, when to use which one, and 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 knowing, you know, more about um, keeping yourself under certain uh, guidelines, and say, okay, this is what I want, and I'm going to continue this path until I get what I want, and and to really uh, know the difference between your body and your spirit, you know, because sometimes our, our bodies are lazy and our bodies don't want to do things. But you mentioned meditation earlier. And, and basically when you sit and meditate, that's what we're doing. We're, we're sitting and saying, okay, I'm not going, going to get up for 30 minutes or an hour and I'm going to not move, you know, and I'm going to breathe and I'm going to be okay with that. And then you do it. And mm-hmm. what happens with that is with time, you start to become self, you know, disciplined and you start to to understand, you know, a lot of things about yourself because you're not moving. And that alone gives you so much more power, you know, and that goes to, you know, one of my favorite definitions of power is the ability to have something, you know, under control, under a time and space. You know, mm-hmm. that's if you can control something, especially your body, which is the closest thing the spirit has to itself then you can really control anything in your life. You know, that's what I think. Right. And, and and self-leadership also leads to leadership to others. And I think the important component about that to leading other people is to motivate other people to have enough compassion and empathy for others to inspire them to do all those things that we mentioned, to have self-knowledge, to have self-esteem, to have self-regulation, to have self-motivation in other people. So self-leadership, is and leadership to others is not about being the boss it's not about being in charge it's not about authority it's not about telling other people what to do it's about inspiring other people to be their best selves so yes. that you cre- you create a team around you so you want everybody who's working with you even if they're working quote under you to be self knowledgeable full of esteem regulated as po- as possible motivated inspired and feel that they have a sense of purpose and a sense of value and to be heard that's the to me the best CEOs that I've ever seen, the best leaders that I've ever seen, have an ability to listen to others and inspire them just by listening, and have mm-hmm. a certain capacity for respect for everybody in the room, and they have a certain reverence about them because of that, not because they're the boss, but because they truly listen and inspire other people to be their best selves. Yes. So, yeah. Yeah. And that's the goal. So mm-hmm. thank you so much for your time. Any last words before we end this podcast? Um, I would say that, uh, again, know yourself, you know, I think Shakespeare said that, you know, uh, ask yourself questions. How do you know that's true of you? Uh, go back to the, the, the origin of self, you know, um, and start there and everything else will fall into place. Self-knowledge, self-esteem, self-regulation, self-motivation and self-leadership. Start with your core beliefs about yourself. How do you know that's true? Where'd you get that idea from? And how do you know that that's the case? And challenge yourself. Um, challenge yourself in terms of what you thought was true about you and um, what you think your strengths and weaknesses are and ask yourself why just remember to ask yourself why do I why do I think that that's what I'm about you know is that is that really what I'm about and this is the time to experiment you know can't go anywhere except with ourselves pretty much so 
you know, yeah. unless you unless you're wearing a mask. <laughs> right. So, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And and trust yourself, you know, believe in yourself. Trust that whatever you feel and whatever you you think is is right. You know, not may not you may not be always right, but there are some times when you are right and it's okay. You know, it's okay to be right and it's okay to also not be right sometimes and and to be, you know, still feel valued um especially by yourself. So, yeah. Hopefully this helps and thank you so much for your time, Neil. And remember, we're here every Tuesday at 6 p.m. If you have any questions, just send them our way. Any comments, you can also come in on our Facebook page, a MindFit Podcast, or uh, we're on Instagram as well. So send us a message. Uh, if you have questions as well, send us a message and we'll definitely answer them on, on the air. So thank you so much again for everyone who's listening and for all those people who've donated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We really appreciate that. And we'll continue to do this podcast for as long as we can. Thank you and have a great week. Thanks so much. Bye. Neil. Bye-bye. This podcast is brought to you by MindFit. Please help us to share this podcast with your friends and family to grow this community. And if you'd like to donate to this podcast or if you'd like to share your comments, questions, or concerns, send them to mindfitpodcast at gmail.com or you can call us directly at 714-328-4661.